This is Today's Business Leaders, actionable advice from real-world professionals. And now, here's your host, Gabe Arnold. All right. On today's show, I have a good friend of mine, a longtime friend. We'll have to figure out how long. Yeah, uh, we, yeah. we go <laughs> way back. Yep. Yeah, um, David Wolf from podcastandradio.com or audiobooksolution.com um, are two of his great properties and places you can find out about them. But welcome back to the show, David. Thanks, Gabe. Great to be with you. Always. Yeah, you are my uh, go-to guy for audio, video, production, also podcasting. You're you're the guy that got me into podcasting. So I remember yeah. those early days. That was fun. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was, was probably rough. Videos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's a it's a process, not a destination. Yeah, it takes it takes a it takes a while to be comfortable on mic and on camera. I think. Uh, so it's it's definitely. I mean, I, I think this is. I think this is coming up close on a hundred episodes of this podcast, and then we did. Yeah. I don't know a handful. And yeah. I'm, I'm probably it does coming take up time, and and, you're, and, and it grows. I've noticed. I mean, I've, I can the quality of the interviews, the quality of everything is is uh, has been um, progressing nicely, and and as well as audience growth, I trust. Yeah, it, that is. And that's the thing that I'm spending more time on learning and figuring out because mm -hmm. I, I originally did this just to have conversations with like-minded entrepreneurs and I really honestly didn't care how many people watch. But I think we have we have like a thousand or so downloads an episode, which which isn't terrible. Um, and we're really- well, that's, Those are good numbers. A yeah, yeah. thousand an episode is good. The average uh, is about uh, 180 or 200 per month. So, wow. so yeah. you're actually well above yeah, what so I would regard to be average. That's good. Yeah. We've gone cross channel, you know, with YouTube and Facebook mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and of course iTunes and we're on the other one, Spotify. Yeah. I can't remember if we're on Stitcher or not at the moment. Actually, I think we are too. I had to look, but yeah, we have across everything we do, you know, it, it goes well and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So thanks for introducing yeah. me to this world. <laughs> well, the fascinating thing about it all is, you know, people tend to think, well, let me get sponsors. Let me get sponsors. I need to monetize the show. I think the, the thing that people miss about podcasting is it's really an opportunity to invite people into your, into your world, your ecosystem to talk to them. And that recording moment, that, that moment you create together with that guest can create longstanding relationships. So the idea is invite people that you want to do business with potential clients, partners, stakeholders, uh, and, and put them in that, that bubble, that podcast bubble and uh, wonderful things can happen in terms of relationship development. So I'm glad you brought that up because I, I haven't ever directly thought about that. I'm aware of that's the, the strategy and how it works. But as I'm, yeah. as I'm looking back now, come October, or September of this year, I think will be two years mm -hmm. and we'll probably be at 120 or 250 episodes by then. Beautiful. And in off the top of my head, I think I've done $350,000 from these interviews indirectly. So you actually have tracked that much revenue simply it, to the podcast. It, in my head, I just added up a few of the major ones that have come out of yeah, it. Not, not that's, everything. That's powerful. <laughs> so, yeah. That's powerful. And that's yeah. like, you could say that that's not direct. I mean. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. indirect in the sense like I don't have sponsors, which is something we'll explore yeah. here soon. Like, I'm, yeah. and I don't even, I don't even advertise my own stuff on the show. <laughs> uh, wow. So these but, are, these are that example where you're inviting people in and they turn into clients. Yeah, exactly. Some cool. huge referral partners and some huge clients have come out of it. And, and the nice thing is that I didn't come into this trying to make money, like you said, of right. with, with the like instant money thing, like, oh, I'm going to have people on and I'm going to get sponsors, which, like I said, we are getting to the point where, where it makes sense to get sponsors. So I'm sure we will. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, but I didn't come in with that intention. I just said, Hey, I want to build a relationship with other entrepreneurs that I like yeah. and I trust. Yeah. And then out of that, all good things happen. And uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, took me, it took me a while to like crystallize this because I'm young. But um, in the last couple of years, <laughs> I have- I'm young too. Okay, hey, come on. <laughs> me too. We're in the same hair club too. Um, but uh, I, I, I realized like one of my core values is relationships are more important to me than money. And when I really put that down on paper and, and started living that even more, because that's always been a value of mine, but it's really crystallized in the last few years. Yeah. 
when I started like saying that's who I am and that's how I operate, it's amazing right. how much more money I made, which is like the opposite of what you would think. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's sort of like what happened to me with meditation, which brought out a lot of what you're talking about. How we make people feel is ultimately more important than what we know and what we do for them. Yeah. In, in a way. And that's, it runs kind of right there with what you're talking about. It's all about people connection. It's everything. Yeah. The people create business activity. It's not the other way around. So, but in, if you're technical, like both you and I are, and you tend to think in terms of data or analytics, or you focus on revenue growth and it, it, that's all good. And you have to do that. But at the core is this relationship conversation we're having. Yeah. And I, there's been a lot of conversations in my circles the last few weeks around value. And that's kind of what we're touching on. And I, yeah. the only true value that you can create comes from inside of you and mm. that's how you serve and help the world and then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the value that people perceive and the value exchange that happens is definitely highly um tied to or at a very high level tied into emotion so yeah. like the which is just what you just said like the feeling that people get from being around you talking to you being on your podcast whatever you do um yeah that's what actually converts and i know this about you you're really um, uh, a brilliant and studied copywriter and headline formulator and yeah. creative that part I, I know that you've thought in terms of how do we get to the emotional side of the spectrum when we're communicating who we are what we do and in, in writing as well right yeah yeah and that's a that's a great analogy to tie in because you'll see a lot of people that can get reach or build an audience or do something on the cheap value the cheap emotions the mm -hmm. cheap emotions are fear and hate mm -hmm. because that's an emotion at least in at least in our society here in the states because i'm most familiar with that but probably oh, yeah. around, probably around the world those are cheap emotions that if you can trigger people you can get their attention and engagement but as a long steady diet of fear and, and anger will burn people out and so they can't stay around you forever so if you watch those quote unquote influencers Yep. that use, you know, fear and anger or like similar emotions, something on the negative end of the spectrum. Yes. They can attract a large crowd, but they can't, I don't think that they're actually putting real value into the world. Whereas if you're steady, if you're kind, if you're strong, if you're on the, what I would say are the more altruistic, you know, more positive end of what you sell emotionally, since we're talking yeah. about sales emotionally, yeah. I think that people trust that longer and you can really nurture them and help them grow rather than me just saying like, Oh, did you read about this crazy headline about like I read about some college scam today? Like if I, if I focused all my, uh, right, right. The college scam to get into Harvard and wherever it was, yeah, the Ivy yeah, League. It, yeah. it creates an ad adrenaline rush right. um, and other, you know, other things for people, but it doesn't actually help them. I don't think. <laughs> exactly. And in, in the media plays on, I mean, every time you turn on any give, you know, name your 24 cycle, seven cycle, News well, channel. you know, broadcast, you know, yeah. I, I would ever say the polit political spectrum, they're both really doing this. They're not going to the love side of the spectrum. They're going to the fear side. I heard a therapist right. that we worked with once said fear and love are the, at the core. That's, those are the only two. That's all there is. Yeah. <laughs> kind of comes out of that. So, but I, and I love, I think about it the same way that there's this adrenaline rush that we can get addicted to. Right. Like if we're walking by the television and you saw something about a horrible tornado, or a plane crash. That's the max. Eight. I mean, you, yeah. yeah, it's like you, it captivates us. Why does that happen? Because there's this cortisol or adrenaline thing that we yeah. we can get. Like it feels like it's it feels pleasurable in the moment, but it really right. is not a sustainable idea. Which is kind of back to what you were saying about it's not yeah. going to be long lasting. But you'll get you'll build the audience quick. And if you think. You know. Yeah, exactly. And if we think about like the cortisol, the stress levels, the negative adrenaline and the negative stress that, that stuff creates, you're actually killing your audience. Like you can't, yeah. you can't put people through that indefinitely. <laughs> right. And, if they last long, they won't last long because they're going to die from having, being unhealthy because of the amount of adrenaline and the, call it stress broadly that. Right. I, I mean, you're legitimately, you're legitimately shortening their life. Absolutely. Which is yeah. ridiculous, and that's not a place I want to. I want to no, play. Or that's be. not value in the in the universe, <laughs> or any universe. Human, the yeah. hu universe of humanity. And and there's a time like you can always. I think it's appropriate to mix in that stuff on a 
rare occasion or appropriately, but if that's your mainstay angle, right. then right. I think you're off base. Just uh, for me, no, it with, no, we're in total, yeah, we're in alignment. Big surprise there. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, can you try to build a business? You know, it's like conscious capitalism. I don't want to build a business around people being feared, fearful, and stressful. And, right. No, I want to satisfy other sets of emotions on the love side of the spectrum, we'll call it, and, uh, you know, help them do what they want to do and support them, which is yeah, really, and, what my, well, really both of our businesses. We're supporting others in many cases. That's Yeah, exactly. And I love, um, I don't know if it's still going on because I know this is a while ago and we haven't yeah. been on the show in a while, but I love what you were doing with your internet radio. You just talked about so uh, conscious capitalism, I think is what you said. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, we, we were, we're donating... Um, um, it, it comes into about 10, I believe the number is 10%. It, I, I actually ended up just doing sort of a round number every month, but we right. donate to RIP Medical Debt, which is a company that, um, it's just one component. You know, I, I heard Howard Schultz speak, and this is long before the presidential stuff. He was just talking about conscious capitalism a couple of years yeah. ago. And it, and I loved how articulately he, 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 he talked about, um, how he thinks about business. Uh, I think the stores are opening, I believe it was in Japan yeah. and it might be China. It was China, I think, uh, where they're actually helping the employees uh, get health care for them and their parents, their entire family. I mean, things like that. I'm not sure I have those details exactly right, but he was right. helping that, or there was a college scholarship fund through Starbucks that they were doing at some point. Mm -hmm. Those types of things. So I thought, well, how can I do that? Um, around this grow your podcast model, this internet radio thing that we've been doing. And so I, I folded it in and, you know, um, the project has been interesting. It's another conversation, but um, I know that there's a, there's a need in the marketplace to better connect podcasters to their audience. Yeah. Analytics wise, the who's listening rather than just how many and then the true engagement and transactional elements that we're looking for, maybe outside of what you and I talked about early in this conversation, uh, where you know you have a guest and that becomes the con that becomes a connection. But with an audience, how do you create that some level of intimacy and the ability to engage and transact? Yeah, um, is a problem that needs to be solved. I'm not sure that the internet radio is the direction that will solve it. I see. Um, like Himalaya that just got funded $100 million. I mean, there are large and well-capitalized capi teams that are trying to solve the app podcast distribution thing, <laughs> problem, yeah. which is really what I see coming, but Super I didn't fracture it, still. Moment. Yeah. it takes a lot of resources to build that. You know, yeah. we talked about that. So Yeah, so but so back to what we can Yeah, yeah I went off the rails there. Yeah. Sorry. Back, to, back to what you're doing, because I, I think it's a really good example of, um, you know, I think you wouldn't mind me saying you're not a hundred million dollar year company or something like, no. like I am. And, but still like in the, in the infancy of you rolling out this new product, you chose to give and do something good. And I think that's really noteworthy. And Thank so, um, one, I'd love to have you send over that talk or whatever you saw if it's somewhere on YouTube, cause I'm always looking for stuff like that. But more importantly, um, you, you watch that, you go, oh, this is how I can make an impact. Walk us through what that felt like and then how you took action and then what you do, what you do donate and what that organization is about. Because I think, I think that approach and how you approach business in that way is really what makes you different. A longstanding friend of mine um, who I actually met through Michael Gerber, a guy named Mark uh, Errol Ehrlich, uh, who also lives in the Southwest. He lives in the uh, Palm Desert area. Uh, we, we connected and he said, look, I'm working with it. What are you doing? Well, I'm working with this group called RIP Medical Debt that basically what they do, these were guys that are, were originally medical debt collectors. So they were making the phone calls to people who owed money to their hospitals or medical providers, yeah. you know, heart attack uh, patients, stroke patients um, across the spectrum. Right. High, high cost, um, surgical procedures, whatever, tr cancer, of course, which can go on for years. Very, very expensive. And what he told me was, is that um, medical debt is the, one the leading causes of bankruptcy, certainly in the U.S., if not worldwide. I can't remember all the data. It's been a little while since I've looked at it. So this, so it turned out that I had a trip going to New York and that's where they're based. They have an office in Manhattan. So I went and met the co-founder 
of our IP medical dent and we had lunch and um, with his assistant and we talked about everything they do and um, I was hooked. I just thought, so what they do is instead, there was a point, I sort of skipped this piece where the founder said, hey, we're, try, we're making these really difficult calls. I hate getting up in the morning and making these calls to people who are in bankruptcy. They're, they're, they're suffering from extreme amounts of stress because they have no money. They're also physically sick, which is the reason they had to spend the money. And they're just wiped out. It's just yeah. the cost of that on so many levels, emotionally and socially. So they decided to flip the model. And rather than collecting pennies on the dollar, to, to, to settle these debts with the service providers, medical service providers, they would buy the debt for pennies on the dollar and then get private, private donations from corporations to fund those purchases. So they would wipe out the debt for the patient. Um, they could rebuild their lives again. And, um, you know, it, it certainly works uh, on a PR level, and I don't mean to get trite, but I mean, right. corporations oh. want to show that they're giving. I mean, that's what I did. I yeah. mean, this is part of it. It's sort of an interesting little dance you're doing where you're, you're doing good, but you're also doing, using it as a marketing uh, technique, you know, because you want the world to know you're doing good. So it, there's right. just a little bit of that going on, but I loved it. And, you know, I couldn't give a ton, but for every, what's the number? For every hundred dollars that I, that, that one donates to this uh, nonprofit, um, I believe it's ten thousand. A hundred dollars wipes out ten thousand dollars worth of debt. No, I've got that wrong. A hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. That's the ratio. It's some ridiculous because they're buying it for pennies on the dollar. Holy shit! So they're using crazy. the same leverage that collectors use, but they're doing it to set to solve this problem for people that have been wiped out by medical debt. That's so cool, man. I know. That's, on, that's entrepreneurship right there. So I just loved it. I know the social entrepreneurship they, they employed. So I said, well, look, I've got, you know, a dozen people paying me to be on my radio network, uh, grow your podcast. Let me take every month. I just send it automatically. And I yeah. sort of wanted it. And it, I don't know if it's exactly 10% of it. Right. That's but it just, it just, just felt really, really good. And um, when yeah. I can raise it, I will. So, yeah. No, that's, that's phenomenal, man. It, um, introduce me when, after the show, introduce me to whoever your contact is over there. I'm super interested in that. <laughs> oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it uh, to Mark Ehrlich uh, and uh, we can put that together. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, uh, so that's, I like that story because one, it, sh it shows who you are and how you do business, which is why we've been friends for a little while now, yeah. <laughs> five, six years or who knows. At least. <laughs> and, uh, and that's like how entre entrepreneurship should be done. It's like, you know, we can, we can re-engineer the model however we want if we're creative enough and there are no rules. And There's totally no rules. It's, that's where the creative stuff comes in. Yeah. Figure out how to engineer conscious capitalism, social good into your business. It is essential uh, as a community, a member of the hum community of humanity yeah. uh, and as business people, we have to do it. And if that's the driver, Yes, as you said, the byproduct will be you'll make all kinds of money and you'll do good things. I, I'm reading, um, it was written in 14, I think it's the sort of the narrative of Bezos building Amazon. And, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag of stuff going on there. Yeah. Uh, but, but he, there was this subject came up recently in the part I'm reading now about missionary versus mercenary. And oh. you could argue whether, you know, look, he's the richest guy in the world. But, but he, in theory at least, go for the missionary because ultimately the byproduct will be uh, uh, yeah. revenue growth. So, yeah, that's very cool. So, yeah, so let's, um, let's shift a little bit. Last time you were on, I know we talked about kind of how you got started. We talked about your bakery experience. We talked about a lot of the entrepreneurial ups and downs. Well, why don't we, why don't we talk a little bit today about um, what, what it's been like the last six, eight months since you came on or whatever. Um, Love yeah. It how you've been shifting and kind of what you're focusing on now. Cause like I said, I know you're doing a ton with podcasting. You have the internet radio thing, which like you said, that may just be a stepping stone to the real technology down the road. We both know that. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably a, a fair way to say it. And um, you know, whether I'm the company to solve it or not, that remains to be seen. I've been looking at how yeah. to do that, but my focus really, what I see now, um, if we'll parenthesize this sort of grow your podcast model, which was a distribution play, Mm -hmm. That's still going on, but the, the business in its purest sense structurally is podcast production and audiobook production. Mm -hmm. Both of the markets are growing basically at equal parts. I might argue that the, 
um, the growth in audiobooks, uh, for whatever reason, had, there's been a, a bit more growth on that side of the business. But what's happened for me formatically in terms of my relationship to the business, and I knew this would happen eventually. I knew it in my mind and I knew it as I plan on my whiteboards. But mm-hmm. now I'm hitting the, the rubbers starting to meet the road where I'm yeah. in a position where I need to pull back from the minutia of the work that I'm doing. And it's not to demean it in any way. It's, it's essential to the services we provide. But right. my relationship to the business has to be about growing the business and customer facing activities because that's where yeah. I'm really strong. And then I've got a team of four editors, a virtual, you know, 1099 type folks that edit the audiobooks for us, which are very long projects. You know, they can be 30, 40, 70,000 word audiobook projects. Yeah. With very specific specs. Uh, for Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. And then on the podcast side, I'm much more involved because it's a it's a much more recurring, not only recurring revenue model, but it's a recurring production model. You know, with right. audiobooks, you, you do the project and it's it's over until the next one. But mm-hmm. but with podcasts, it's every week, there's a new episode and, you know, you have this recurring activity. And um, so amidst all of this, I'm working on how to pull myself back from the details and begin to assign projects out and do more outsourcing uh, whether it's white labeling or some form of outsourcing direct 1099 relationships. Yeah, that's excellent. And I, I think you're right about the podcast versus audiobook space because hmm. podcasting is very low barrier to entry in the sense that like, oh, I have an idea for a show. I'm going to do a podcast. And it's, I mean, it's pretty click and play if you don't want it produced at the level that you obviously produce. And there's less people that know how to monetize it. Like I said, I don't directly monetize it. It monetizes fine for me, like we just talked. But but it's like, it's kind of like the entry level wars. You're doing an audio book, you have a more direct path to revenue. So I'm sure it's growing differently and dollar for dollar even though there's more activity on the podcast side, I bet the revenue on the audiobook side is going to outgrow it at some point is the way I feel. Your instincts are right about that. You know, know, and I had a, my son is a banker. He's a business banker. And he uh, said to me, I don't know how he, he's, he had this prophetic thought that, that I should really be focusing only on audiobooks, which was fascinating to me. And I understand the narrowness and deep idea. Mm-hmm. Um, the other, the counter argument is that it's all audio production and it's all the same work. embrace both sides of that market. And so, yeah. yeah, that's more complex to run as a business. And, um, there's always this fear that you're leaving things. I am continuing to get referrals and calls for podcast production. And I think that that's a signal to me that I'm filling a need. And I think we tell you, this is back to the relationship part. Yep. There are companies out there that do podcast production where it's a little bit more automated. You know, you Dropbox your audio and you, and then they have a system and they create, it's more systematized than my business. My, my contact with my clients tends to be much more touchy feely and much right. more customized. So it's not infinitely scalable because it's about me doing that. But mm-hmm. That's the reason I'm getting, I'm winning business because people like the closeness, the intimacy of, of the way I work. I think it's playing out on both sides. So the, somewhat analogous to what was going on in my music production business years ago, where it was all about me writing the music. The challenge here is uh, if I'm really effective at being the connection guy in the work I do, I need, first of all, phase one is to outsource the stuff that's not very um, personal in terms of its contact with clients. It's just editing or production. Um, and I say just, just, it's not client facing. So it's, it's not something I should be spending my time doing. So that's sort of the major shift I'm in now. Sorry if that was a roundabout. Was there a question in there somewhere? Um, <laughs> no, you're good. Uh, I like, I like how you're breaking it down. Cause I think that, I think first to understand that you have to shift is, is yeah. one yeah. so like oh i have to change like and I, I mean honestly i can't tell you how many people don't have that realization <laughs> well and i know that you've gone through many many i'm guessing i'm, I'm i don't know but i'm guessing because of the no. nature you have a very virtual large team a lot of yeah. virtual uh employees or yeah. quasi employees contractors in yeah. your ecosystem and you're and you've got an assistant and you're managing a lot of and staying very calm at the same time so 
usually. I want to be like that. I want to be like you as I grow this thing uh, in that sense. Uh, yeah. I'll be who I am. But hmm. So if I can just focus on the client stuff and the direct production, and then there's this level where I start to even introduce new producers that help the the podcasters and I sign the vision would be to assign, let's say three to five alternates to me that, mm. uh, that, that, that do what I'm doing in their way. And, you know, exactly. uh, and so, and letting go of a lot of that, it's scary and it's exciting. Yeah. I was, I think a big key is like taking, you mentioned earlier, which is something I've been doing a lot more over the last couple of years. So you mentioned meditation yeah. and I think the big value of meditation, which you can you can connect or disconnect the eastern philosophies that go with that that's not really part of what i'm saying they're they're mm -hmm. there or not doesn't matter right but the when we relax our mind enough to give ourselves time to reflect and think about the future and think about our behavior and think about how we feel and like analyze and be an observer of our life yes then we then we can go oh i keep bumping the ceiling because I need to outsource this part or, Oh, I keep hitting this because I'm uncomfortable because I have fear around it. Like this will sound stupid, but I'll say it anyway. Um, I'm, uh, I'm in the process of building a two year content marketing plan for my team so that I don't have to be the only one driving content, which I'm not the only one that drives content for our team, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a mix and match and it works um, for like our internal products and stuff. And I have all this anxiety about letting go of it. <laughs> Oh yeah, man. Oh, I'm right there. So I mean, silly. <laughs> I look at I look at my twelve podcasts that I have in production right now on the whiteboard over there, and I'm like, okay, how? And it's the step of beginning to assign. I'll give this one to Sean. I'll give this one to Sid. I'll give this one to Shane. I've got these different editors that want the work, right? But there's this step into that space of letting go. Um, Very scary sometimes, even on the dumbest things. And I, I would consider myself to be a pretty good delegator. We have, we have, yeah. no, no, you have the natural thing, but even for, I think part of your point is even for you, an experienced delegator and letting go of our, our letting go of her, uh, you even struggle with this, which yeah. is. So I was telling my project lead, um, our operations consultant that works internally and does consulting for operations for our clients. Like I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, I was mm -hmm. telling her, I'm like, just so you know, I'm su I have a ton of anxiety about this, so I'm going to try not to be a dick about it, which I will. I love that you're real about it, though. <laughs> but I was like, I'm super wound up about this, and I don't know why. And, like, I think communicating like that with people makes it a lot easier to support each other, which is, which is one part. And then the other part is, like, this is the biggest lie that we tell ourselves as entrepreneurs, especially in early stage. We tell ourselves, oh, well, nobody could do it like me. Yes, like it's true. If you like, there would be a different face on the camera right now if you were interviewing one of the podcasts. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. so it would be different and it'd be a different personality. However, in many cases, if you build the business right, those people can do it better than you. <laughs> like, yes, because they're yes. so focused on their role that they're right. not like, I mean, it's, I, I work hard to, in these interviews, pay full attention and have a, a really, I actually listen and have a deep conversation. Yeah. However, like, you and I know, like there's another 20% in the back of our heads of like, Oh, I got to do this afterward and I got to do this. Like we're yeah, the, it's, it's the, I got, I got to mind. Did I, did I tell you about, you mentioned meditation TM specifically. There's a great video. If I didn't send you this link, I should have. It's uh, Bob Roth and you can find it on YouTube. Just Google Bob Roth TM. And okay. he talks about the God of this, God of this, God of this, God of this. He's in the context of explaining what transcendental meditation is, but it's, uh, right. but um, th that 20%. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got our screens open. 80% mm -hmm. of the screen is, uh, is a Gabe Arnold and the rest of it is the emails that I have to answer when we're done or the, <laughs> the calendar that's telling me what I'm going to be doing after the interview. Yeah. It's just hard yeah. as entrepreneurs to, um, to be singularly focused. I think part of why we do what we do is we like it being a little busy. Oh, then yeah, we like the creativity. We like a little noise and there's nothing wrong with that. And you shouldn't judge your own mind on that. That's a part of meditation. Obviously, exactly. Not, do not, not judge it. Yep. It's observation and just loving and like curiously exploring where you're Beautifully at. said. Yeah. And uh, however, like when we do outsource to somebody that's not like crazy entrepreneurial, because if we were all entrepreneurs, the world would be a bad place too. Um, <laughs> When we give it to somebody with single focus, then they can just focus in and they can actually execute better many times. Yeah. So right. you've learned this and you know it, but yet still 
when there's a, a threshold of, and I'm right there. I'm like, right. I got yeah. you know a bunch of work I've got to send out so I can free up and think again about the business outside, you know, about, well, how do they say that? I uh, think, um, work outside the business, uh, right. or work on the business rather than every day. Yeah. And so that's where most people don't scale and that's where most people lose all their profits, I think. And, mm -hmm. and then when they try, they, they also make this mistake, which will be useful to you and, and the audience too, I think is mm. sometimes we finally build up the courage to delegate and we're just like, here, do all this, David. And then I, what if I've never worked with you or what if I've never put you in that role and then you blow it? Like right. then I'm like, Oh, I'm never going to delegate again. Like right. it, it, we, right. create our, we run the risk of having a, a very, very, what would I call this a, a violent reaction to whatever occurred rather than looking at it as a, a, an opportunity to, to develop over time. I right. Guess part of what, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, so I've learned to give small test projects that don't risk my whole business or my whole customer relationship. I naturally do the same. I know exactly. So, oh, here's a simple, fairly simple editing problem. Can you do this? <laughs> do this one. And then, oh, they really handed. Now, I do. I'll, I'll admit, I had one uh, client that uh, it ran. It's it's over now. The contract's over. It was a complex editing matrix, and I gave it to a guy who was a com music composer, and he just he just tore it up. He was great. He did it better than I would have done it because right. as back to your book, he was singularly focused on it and he had the capacity technically to pull it off. I guess on some level I knew that, but yeah, in practice, just do a test and don't do, you don't have to leg in all the way. So right. you have this violent reaction to the it not working. Yeah. yeah. So the, the trust, but verify saying whoever yeah, trust it, it. is always like, Keep that in mind and do little pieces because you have to learn to be a good delegator and you have yep. to delegate to people that should be delegated to. And it's it's another it's another skill set in the how many skills do we have to collect as entrepreneurs? Hundreds and hundreds. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so yeah, Absolutely. so the, so that's been uh, that I constantly run into that multiple times throughout the year. Where I'm like, I've got to give this up if I want to grow personally and if I want to grow the business. And then some things, it's like, oh, I don't care about that, like. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give me anxiety. And sometimes I'm like, oh my God, this is my baby. I can't give this away to anybody. And that's a great way to stop growth. <laughs> so I have a question about all of this. And this has occurred to me, obviously, that's why I'm asking the question. As a guy who's done a lot of delegating over many, many, many years, do you ever fear that someone, I'll say it, I don't even like this language, but you're, they could steal your client or they could develop a relationship with the client that you've uh, assigned them to that's yeah. more uh, for whatever reasons that you may have to let go because that was meant to be. I mean, how do you think about that? That's a great question. Um, one, I'm very careful and I do those tests with people. Um, I'm very careful who I bring on my team. So we're really, really intentional about the culture we build and how we take care of people. Mm. And then two, I'm very careful with the clients I work with because like this, I would say this, I would be shocked if this would happen with where our team is at today. But if say I sent somebody to work with you and help you with something like we've talked about earlier yeah. and, and they tried to sell you on the side, I know you would come straight to me and say, Hey, just so you know, this doesn't feel right. Cause I right. trust you as a client. I would do that. So it's, it's just this faith that, that who you're working with are the right people. And yeah. if they're not, they'll self select out anyway. And you don't want to be around them anyway. So what's the difference? Yeah. And then the other part of it is, um, in our t team, we highly encourage entrepreneurship. So it's like, if you want to start your side thing, how can I help you? If you, if yeah. I can do a little coaching to help you on your yeah. side project, I will, because then you create this inclusive culture. Inclusive cultures always grow and protect themselves. Whereas extractive cultures were like, Oh, you know, you can never talk to, you know, you can never start your own business or we're going to control everything in, a, in like a negative controlling manner. Mm -hmm. Those are the cultures, and if you study this from a world society perspective, those are the cultures that implode and don't work. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. Exactly. That's, that's exactly. kind of like, you know, North Korea and Venezuela and places like that where they're going to try to extract all, all the value without helping their own people. And then they wonder why their societies are imploding on themselves. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, 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 so, right. So, so, I, so, so it is all about the relationships first. And I, um, and like, honestly, the, the, the other safeguard is like, you're more than welcome to try to take my clients from me. I can outwork you and I have better clients than you think I do. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So like I have a lot of self-confidence too, that it's like, well, if that happened, which it hasn't happened in years, probably right. in years. Right. Um, 
then it wasn't the right client or it wasn't the right team member and I'm okay. I'll recover. So I, you, don't, you don't create like this formal agreement or anything. It's just a, a mutual understanding that that's not okay. Is that I, how you handle it? Technically there's a couple lines in the, in the contract they sign, but it's not, it's even that it's not heavy handed. Yeah. And it's like that stuff's unenforceable basically, unless you have a deep pockets and you want to go to court and nobody wants to do that. Like, well, exactly. I mean, why even go there? I'm producing a book called The Millennial Whisperer by an author named Chris Tuff. Nice. And Chris is an, he wrote an amazing book. And in it, he talks about exact, uh, he has a, uh, uh, what's the name of it? 22 Squared, I think is the name of their marketing firm. It's a large, large marketing firm. He's one of the partners. I think Chris is in his mid thirties. He, um, he, he talks about, they actually actively help their employees, if they have a side hustle, they will actually work with them to help them further their, that cause, that personal so cool. entrepreneurial side gig thing that they're doing because they feel the energy will ultimately serve the organization and its culture as well. Yep. I have people that I've unfortunately had to let go and have come back to me multiple times now over the past years and said, Wow. I loved working with you. I'm going to hire you because things are growing. I super appreciate that you helped me with my business. Like that's the world I want to live in. I don't yeah, want to, I don't want it to be a uh, all negative and like competitive in the wrong way. Yeah. It's it, well, again, <laughs> fear and love, right? So that's on the fear spectrum of I'm afraid people are going to take my, it's uh, yeah. It, yeah. It's like <laughs> so, fear of people stealing ideas, you know, it's kind yeah. of, so, so that's just, that's a poverty mindset is the short answer. Big, which, well, nicely said. Poverty that, mind. That, that won't serve you at well at all. So <laughs> I love that way of thinking poverty mindset. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, so let, um, we'll wrap up here. I'm going to just share with people a little bit more about my experience, what you offer and how they can get a hold of you. Thank you. Um, and then we'll, we'll definitely have you back on whenever you have time to come back on. So, um, like I said, I'm, I met David a long time ago on LinkedIn in an affiliate marketing group. Um, and, uh, he's somebody that I super trust. We've done business on both sides. He takes great care of my clients um, when I send them his way and he does internal stuff for us. Um, he helps authors, coaches, speakers, entrepreneurs, business leaders, you know, of any kind leverage audio. I think that's an easy way to kind of explain. It doesn't matter what, if it's audiobooks or podcast or um, even he does, you know, video and, <clears throat> and on-site production at times too, you know, he, but uh, he's definitely somebody I'd recommend you guys check out. Um, you can go to audiobooksolution.com or podcastandradio.com. It's kind of two different faces of, of what he offers. And, uh, you know, it's def like I said, he's definitely somebody I really trust and I highly recommend. So I'm glad we got to hang out today, David. Thank you for having me, Gabe. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to Today's Business Leaders with Gabe Arnold. Remember to subscribe on iTunes. For more information, visit todaysbusinessleaders.com.